If y'all would please open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm asking the question in today's message. What kind of man are you? What kind of man are you or woman? Usually, we as Christians tend to lump the people of this world into two categories. The saved and the lost. What J. Vernon McGee used to call the saints and the ain'ts. And I like, kind of like that. But Paul says here, actually, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, that we should actually consider uh, three categories of men rather than just two. Paul says, beginning in verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Then Paul says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Then Paul says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Oh, but judge not that ye be not judged. No, the Bible says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Paul says, continuing into chapter 3 then, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal. We talk in the church here at Corinth. Carnal church. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Notice here that Paul is clearly talking to Christian brethren. He's talking to Christians here who are being immature and, in fact, carnal, he says. These are brethren, being carnal. And I, brethren, Paul says, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Paul says, verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither now, neither yet now are ye able. Verse 3, for ye... Speaking to brethren here, are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not yet carnal and walk as men? Paul says here, not only uh, are there both saints and ain'ts saved in the lost, but he also says sometimes saints act like ain'ts because they are yet carnal, because they refuse to grow up as they are expected to do as Christians. We're all supposed to be growing as Christians, and some Christians just don't seem to want to grow up. And so Paul really addresses three categories of persons in this passage. First, the natural man in verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Second, we see the spiritual man in verse 15 through 16. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. Third, then, we see the carnal man in verse 1 through 3 of chapter 3. And my brethren cannot speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. I want to focus here a little bit on each of these three types of people. First, Paul reveals a natural man. Again, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. In John chapter 3, the Lord Jesus told a Pharisee about the plight of the natural man, saying, we read in John 3 verse 1, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man 
can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Marvel not, I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus, You think you know who I am, but you really don't. You really don't know who I am, because you're not born again. He said, I'm, he's saying I'm far more than a prophet that can do miracles like Elijah did, or just a teacher sent by God. He's saying, if you really want to know who I am, you need to be born again. It almost looks like he's not answering him there, but that's really what he's answering him. The reason the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. The reason that we teach in this church that there is no true salvation without transformation is because, as Paul says in, in this passage that we're studying today, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because they're spiritually discerned. He can't see the kingdom of God. He's not born again. Keeping a marker in 1 Corinthians 2, please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Paul further describes the natural man here in Ephesians chapter 2 in describing what we as born again saints of God used to be. Saying in verse 1, And you, Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That word quickened, of course, means brought to life, means made alive. Talking about a resurrection here. This verse describes a spiritual resurrection from spiritual death that was caused by our sin. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom we also, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, Paul says, the children of wrath, even as others. Paul says here that the natural man is dead in trespasses and sins, and that's why he must be born again, or resurrected, quickened, as Paul says here. Dead in trespasses and sins, or being spiritually dead, actually means several things. First of all, the natural man has no appreciation or desire for the things of God. They're foolishness unto him, Paul says. And uh, they're, he can't know them because they're spiritually discerned. Secondly, the natural man has no appreciation of or desire for or understanding of the word of God. Jesus said in John chapter 8 to the Pharisees who claimed to be the religious leaders, he said to them in John 8, 47, He that is of God heareth God's words. He said to the Pharisees, Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. He's saying that you don't understand what I'm saying, because you're not born again. You've not been born of God. You're not of God. John 8, 37. He says to the Pharisees, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. He says, verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. These men claim to be religious. I mean, they were the religious leaders of their day. And yet they could not understand Jesus' speech. They weren't... They had not been born again, and they could not see the kingdom of God. And so then third, the natural man has no understanding of the depth of or the due penalty of his own sin. The natural man has no understanding of the depth of his own sin or the penalty thereof. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It's foolishness to them because they don't understand their own sin, their own need for a Savior. So the natural man has no understanding of the depth of his sin or his need to be saved. It makes no sense to him. It's foolishness. Fourthly, the natural man has no spiritual vision. He cannot see or perceive the kingdom of God. 
As Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 3 through 4, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of men, blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Some uh, Piper Calvinists believe that Paul's talking there when it says that the God of this world has blinded them. Some Piper Calvinists say that's God has blinded them because they're not, not the elect. But I believe Jesus teaches in the parable of the sower that the devil comes and steals that word. It's the devil that has blinded the minds, the, the eyes and the minds of them which believe not. The God of this world is the devil. Number five, the fifth thing that characterizes a natural man is that he operates on worldly wisdom rather than the wisdom of God. Natural man operates on worldly wisdom rather than the wisdom of God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where we already were. Paul says in verse 4, verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 2, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of pa- and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. He says, verse 6, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, in other words, the saints, it's wisdom to them, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, hidden to the natural man, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they'd had the wisdom of God rather than the wisdom of man, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord. Paul says that the natural man operates on worldly wisdom rather than the wisdom of God. And worldly wisdom, by the way, is deceptive and dangerous. The wisdom of this world is exactly what is taking billions of Christ-rejecting souls to an eternal hell. The wisdom of this world is dangerous, deceptive. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, chapter 1, verse 21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, by its wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God that by the foolishness of preaching, by what the natural man perceives as foolishness, by the way, to save them that believe. Paul says, But for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, again, worldly wisdom, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, unto the Greeks, the natural man, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, and to us, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the natural man operates on worldly wisdom rather than the wisdom of God. And that's why the wisdom of this world is exactly what's taking billions of lost souls, Christ rejecting souls to an eternal hell. But we were all at one time natural men and women. But thank God he didn't leave us in that condition. Amen? Amen? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God, who was rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. He says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, verse 8, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are not saved by works, but we were saved unto good works so that we could walk in them, Paul says. Ephesians 2, verse 8, Paul says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So is Paul saying here that our salvation is the gift of God or that our faith is the gift of God? The answer is that both of these things, both grace and faith, are the gift of God. Amen. Why is that? It's because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, 
He, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Because the natural man operates on worldly wisdom rather than the wisdom of God. He has no appreciation or desire for the things of God. He has no appreciation or desire for the word of God. And he has no understanding of the depth of his sin, the penalty thereof. And that's why the Lord Jesus said in John 6, verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I raise him up at the last day. And verse 65 of John 6, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except it were given him of my Father. Without the conviction of the Holy Ghost drawing us to salvation, without the quickening power of God opening our eyes to see the truth, we would all still be natural men and women on our way to hell. We were all at one time natural men and women, but thank God he didn't leave us in that condition. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that's the natural man. Uh, let's look at the spiritual man. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? In other words, he says, but we have the mind of Christ. Here Paul describes a man who has been born again and is walking in the power of the Spirit. He's feeding on God's Word. He's not living in unrepentant sin. And he's growing in Christ as we're all supposed to do. He's bearing fruit. And Paul says that man has the mind of Christ. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that we know all that Christ knows or that we think all of Christ's thoughts. Jesus is still eternal God. And he still says, For as the heavens are higher than, than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. However, in now having the mind of Christ, we now have a new mind that has been renewed by the power of Christ. It actually means many things. First, it means, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 1, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It means we've been born again. We've been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. It means we pass from death to life, as Jesus said in John 5, 24. It means, as Paul says in Romans 12, verse 2, that we have been transformed by the renewing of our minds. It means we have been indwelt by the Holy Ghost. And therefore, it means that we have been given new spiritual eyes to perceive the kingdom, to see the kingdom that Nicodemus couldn't see. We've got new spiritual eyes to perceive God's truth that we were once blind to and didn't care about. It means that we've been given a new nature, that wars against the flesh, we've been made partakers of the divine nature. We've been translated into Christ's kingdom. We're no longer of this world, the Bible says. We now have a new love for the Word of God, and the things of God, and especially a new love of the Son of God. John eight forty two. Jesus said, If God were your Father, to the Pharisees again, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. And also Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. And all these things, uh, we now have what Paul calls the mind of Christ. We've been given a new mind that has been renewed by Christ's power. And so first Paul describes a natural man, the unregenerate, and he describes a spiritual man who has been born again and is walking in the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Spirit. Then Paul says there is a third category here. Uh, while the foregoing description of the spiritual man should describe all Christians, our character and nature at all times. However, Paul says that is sadly not the case. He says here is the carnal man, verse 1 of chapter 3, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye now able. Verse 3, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men. There are two or three primary reasons for Christians being carnal. And one reason that some Christians are carnal is actually bad theology. They've been taught wrong. Some Christians foolishly really believe that God's grace is licensed to sin. That's because there are some supposed Christians, self-proclaimed Christians, who teach that God's grace is licensed to sin. 
former Catholic uh, priest Martin Luther had a lot of courage for which he should be admired. He, he did ignite the fires of the Protestant Reformation. But Luther was not the best of theologians. Uh, first of all, he retained far too much Roman Catholic doctrine, including baptismal regeneration, infant baptism, and other errors. Since most Catholics, especially the priests, by the way, seem to have a theology of live it up and do what you will as long as you, you know, uh, take your, get your cookie from the priest every week. Luther apparently retained also far too much uh, Catholic thinking on that point as well. In a letter to a fellow reformer, uh, Luther wrote this, If you are a preacher of mercy, do not preach an imaginary but a true mercy. If the mercy is true, you must bear, therefore bear the true, not an imaginary sin. Luther said, God does not save those who are only imaginary sinners. He said, be a sinner and sin boldly, but let your trust in Christ be stronger and rejoice in Christ who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. I submit to you that that is horrible theology. That's horrible theology on Luther's part. Just go ahead and sin. You can't help it. That's what Christ died for. That is not what the Bible teaches. God's grace is not licensed to sin. Paul says, as you know, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we, we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, who are dead to sin, live any longer therein? He says, verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. He says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. We've been freed from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. As well, God's grace is not licensed to sin. We're not supposed to surrender to sin, and we do not ever, ever have to sin. We don't have to surrender to sin. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there is no, there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted beyond that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that he may be able to bear it. We're not supposed to surrender to sin, and we never, ever have to surrender to sin. Turn to Revelation chapter 2, please. God's grace is not licensed to sin. Many people have a false view of the Lord Jesus, imagining that he just wakes at our sin and says, oh, that's okay, I died for you. Uh, don't worry about it, no problem. But we actually get a glimpse of the real Jesus, in Revelation chapter 2, of how the real Jesus views licentiousness or the doctrine that God's grace provides a license to sin. By the way, I think we better pay attention to what he has to say here as well. He said to the church at Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet, are like fine brass. That speaks of his coming in judgment, by the way. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last be more than the first. He commends this church. Then he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest, you permit, you put up with that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. She taught that grace was licensed to sin, as was uh, others also taught in the first century of the church and have ever since. Jesus says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her, Jesus says, into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. This is very strong language in verse 23. Jesus, the gentle Jesus, says, And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. I believe when Jesus says, I'll kill her children with death, he's talking about those who who believed her doctrine and then were taking it further uh, from there as well. I believe that's what that's talking about there. But one thing we can conclude here definitely is that the Lord Jesus does not tolerate 
taking his atonement as license to sin. He doesn't tolerate that. And so the first reason I think some Christians are carnal is due to bad theology. Some Christians really foolishly believe that God's grace is licensed to sin. I, when I, before I got truly born again in my earlier years, thought I was a Christian, and I pretty much, that's the way I lived, that's the way I felt. I'm saved, I was baptized when I was nine years old. You know, I've got God's grace, I can live it up, and that's exactly what I did. And I was going to hell. There are Christians who believe, or carnal Christians, and many pseudo-Christians like I was. I was a make-believer who believed that God's grace was licensed to sin. Another reason for carnality among Christians is spiritual immaturity. And that's probably the biggest one. Spiritual immaturity. Some Christians are carnal by choice because they simply refuse to grow up. They refuse to grow up. By the way, immature Christians are far more likely, by the way, to be deceived by bad theology as well. But again, Paul says in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Paul says here that a reason for carnality, for carnality in the church at Corinth, was that many were still immature. They were failing to grow up in Christ. There is indeed a growth process to Christian maturity. Of course, newborn believers, babes in Christ who are new to the Word of God, can't start out running. Uh, but there is supposed to be spiritual growth. We're not supposed to remain babes, as, men, as some seem to do. Unfortunately, there does seem to be some Christians who just, they, they seem to be truly saved. They've got a great testimony of salvation. But their Christian growth seems to be, have been stunted for some reason. With the natural man, growth is impossible because he's spiritually dead. With the spiritual man... However, growth is empowered because he's quickened by the Holy Spirit. He's walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. But with the carnal man, growth is impaired, and that's by choice. There are some, or many, actually, saints today that foolishly choose to live like ain'ts. They refuse to feed themselves on God's Word because like little babies, they expect someone else to feed them. The carnal man has had the opportunity and the, and the ability to grow, but for whatever reason, he's chosen not to do so. Paul says in our text in verse 2, I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet, now are ye able. The carnal man lives on a, a spiritual diet, restricted spiritual diet of baby food. He may bounce from church to church, complaining he's not being fed, but just as Paul here describes three categories of people, there's also, I believe, three stages in the Christian life. And we should be growing as Christians. And stage one in the Christian life is, of course, when you have to be fed, just like a baby. When you're fed, someone else has to feed you. But then we should proceed on to where we can feed ourselves. As John says in, I think, uh, Second John, you have an unction from the Holy One and need not anyone teach you. We should all be growing to that place where we have no need anyone teach us. We have an unction from the Holy One. We can read God's Word. God illumines our eyes to it. He teaches us as we go along. We should all be growing in that way so we can feed ourselves. Then stage three, every Christian should go to, should get to, is when you can feed others. That's what the Bible teaches. We should all be wanting to grow to the place where we can teach others as well. Every Christian should have a desire and should be growing towards stage three when he can teach others. Paul says this also as he addresses Christians who refuse to mature in Hebrews chapter 5. It's all about failing to go on to maturity. Saying in verse 12 of Hebrews 5, For when the time, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Same exact analogy there. Paul says, verse 13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful, 
in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So Paul defines spiritual immaturity as one who doesn't know the word of God. He's unskillful in the word of righteousness. By the way, as Christians, you should be learning the word of God. You should be becoming a theologian yourself. We should all become theologians. We should care about doctrine. Each one of us should. Verse 14, but strong meat, that's difficult doctrine, belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Paul then goes on in chapter 6 to talk about, let's, let's move on from these elemental things. Baby food in the gospel. Let's go on to maturity. That's what uh, Paul talks about there in the first verses of chapter 6 of Hebrews. Turn to Matthew chapter 13, please. Matthew 13. I have preached more than once from Christ's parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, uh, which I believe more than any other teaching of Christ explains why some Christians just never seem to grow in the faith. It's explained here in this parable... I want to do just a quick summary and review of the principles in this parable that some here may not have yet heard or understood. It just actually so happens that this parable is a great parallel to what Paul says in our text uh, because the Lord Jesus also here in this parable compares the natural man and the carnal man and the spiritual man here in this parable. Matthew 13, verse 3. He spake many things unto them in parables, saying... Behold, the sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Verse 5, some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they were on the hard ground, they withered away. Verse 7, some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Verse 8, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. As most of us know, of course, the seed in this parable represents the Word of God. The entire Word of God, by the way, not just the Gospel. It's not just about evangelism. This is about how we grow as Christians in Christ. And so the parable is about the Word of God being sown in our hearts, and also about evangelism as well. But this is about how God dispenses His truth to those who will receive and obey it. That's what this parable is about. How God dispenses His truth to those who will receive it and who will obey it. In the middle of the parable here in verse 9, Jesus says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And this is really what the parable is about having ears to hear. The reason some Christians fail to grow is that they refuse to listen. They don't have ears to hear. Their pride keeps them from listening to other people or whatever it may be. Some Christians fail to grow because they refuse to listen. They don't have ears to hear. Some, due to disinterest and apathy, for me that's very difficult to understand. Um, I have a hard time understanding how a truly born-again child of God can be apathetic toward the Word of God. I don't, I don't get that. Because when I got born again, I, I just immediately, you know, 30 years ago, Amen. had a hunger and a thirst to know the Word of God. And so I don't understand how a Christian who is born again can have no interest in doctrine or the Word of God. I don't get that. That aside, though, Jesus says here in verse 19, that all men do have different responses to the Word of God, some reject it outright because, as Paul said, Satan has blinded their eyes to truth, as Jesus says here, verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So Satan blinds him to the truth. Others make a show of receiving it. There are make believers who fall away because they're still unregenerate natural men. We see that in verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and in all with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath no root in himself, uh, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended, meaning he turns aside from the truth and he apostatizes, which means he wasn't saved to begin with. Then in verse 22... 
Christ describes the carnal man who is saved but fails to bear fruit for the kingdom. He also that receives seed, verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns, is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. He doesn't fall away, but he doesn't bear any fruit. And this is the unfruitful carnal Christian. And then Christ describes a spiritual man who bears much fruit from the kingdom and will be re- rewarded for his labors. Verse 23, but he that receiveth seed, he that receives seed unto the good ground, is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. In the middle of the parable then, after giving the word of warning in verse 9, that those with ears had better listen, in one of the most important verses in the Bible, verse 12, which, by the way, this is a verse that really explains why some Christians grow and mature in the faith and others show no growth after sitting in a church pew maybe for 40 years. Jesus says, verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Whosoever hath, he's talking about having ears to hear. Verse 9. Whosoever hath in verse 12 refers to having ears to hear, as we see in verse 9. For whosoever hath ears to hear, to him shall be given what? Spiritual truth, revelation. He'll be given God's truth. Those who obey the truth, in other words, are given more revelation of God's truth. As we obey more, God gives us more. That's what he's saying here. So they grow and they mature in the faith. You grow as you obey the word of God. As you obey, God gives you more, tr- more truth and you keep growing. Then what what Jesus says, But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. That means if you disobey the truth, then God sends darkness. The important lesson from this parable is this. What you do with the word of God determines what God will do with you. What you do with the Bible determines what God will do with you. When we reject the light, God allows us to go into deception. When we reject the light, God may actually send darkness. So what you do with the Bible determines what God will do with you. Those that refuse to obey the light they are given, perhaps refusing to repent of some known sin uh, that God work, God's work convicts us of. Some Christians fail to grow spiritually or doctrinally due to their own pride. The Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And that principle certainly applies in the way that he gives revelation or illumination to some and conceals it from others. Which, by the way, is why we read in Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 21, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, those that think they're wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. So whether refusal to obey the truth we are given is due to stubbornness or pride or laziness or simply... Surrendering ourselves to fleshly desires. Those who fail to obey will fail to grow. And that's why some Christians just never seem to grow up. God will just leave you where you are if you don't want to obey his word. And you'll just remain a spiritual baby until you repent and go back and obey the the light that you were given, that you disobeyed. Go back and obey what God told you to do, and then he'll give you more and you'll grow up. And so the second reason that some Christians walk in carnality is because of self-imposed immaturity. There is a third reason. uh, Even some mature Christians become carnal, uh, which is also self-imposed or by choice, and that is by backsliding or by choosing to sin when they know better. And sometimes mature Christians, they can actually fall back into sin, become carnal, they can become entangled, possibly even addicted to some sin. They find themselves being powerless or having trouble at least getting back out of. I preached a message some time back on this subject uh, about backsliding titled, Return, You Backsliding Children. And for those in that condition, I would urge you to go back and listen to that message in full. There is a remedy for backsliders that I'll come back to momentarily. So that's the, the three categories of people Paul addresses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man who receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. And then we see the spiritual man who has the mind of Christ, 
and who therefore judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. He produces fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Then we see the carnal man, babes in Christ, who must be fed with milk and not with meat, who are yet carnal and walk as men. And because they're not growing, they develop maybe some self-consciousness. They don't, they're, they're, you know, they don't talk much, they don't say much, and they think that they uh, you know, can't do much. And I would say that you just need to get in God's Word and obey it, and, and God will lead you. And uh, the carnal man can also include mature saints who fall back into sin and become entangled in it. Here's a warning, word of warning, to all Christians who choose to remain babes in Christ and walk in the flesh, refusing to repent. You will one day regret your folly as a judgment seat of Christ, and if not before, if you're not chastised long before then. Second Corinthians 5, we talked about this just a few weeks back, about the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And remember Paul says in that passage, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, because that judgment seat of Christ will be far more terrible than some think. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Here's another warning as well. Many who claim to be Christians are carnal because they're not truly saved. They don't have true salvation. They've never been truly born again. A man who can continue in known, unrepentant sin and not be miserable in conviction over his sin, I believe is is on all likelihood not saved at all. Because if you're saved and you're in sin, you're going to be miserable about it. That's what the Bible teaches. 1 John chapter 3, I recommend you read that chapter. We've been born of God, John says, we cannot sin because his seed abides in us. The Holy Spirit living in us will not allow us to sin. He'll make us miserable in it. That's what John means there in 1 John chapter 3. That said, though, Paul does say in our text that some Christian brethren do become carnal. And for these and other reasons as well. There are saints and there are ain'ts. And, that, and then there are saints that want to live like ain'ts. The question today is, what kind of man are you? What kind of man are you? If you are a natural man, and you don't care about the things of God, if they seem as foolishness to you, then I tell you today that you are a sinner who has violated God's laws, and that you stand condemned before God, and on your way to an eternal hell. And you need to repent of your rebellion against God, understand that the Lord Jesus died, on the cross to pay your penalty for sin. He gloriously rose from the dead three days later. And you need to believe the gospel, repent of your sin, receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and be born again today by the power of God. If you are a carnal Christian today and you know it, if you're saved but you don't care enough about the things of God because you're too distracted by the cares of this life, the things of the world, then you too need to repent. And you need to determine to grow up. Begin to feed yourself on the Word of God. Read your Bible. As Jade said, first hour, listen to sermons on sermon audio rather than watching TV or playing on Facebook. Grow up to the point where you can begin to teach others. If you're a mature Christian who has backslidden, as I mentioned, there is a remedy for your backsliding. And the remedy for a backslider is much the same as it is for, for the spiritual baby. That's just the same as the prophet Jeremiah said to Old Testament Israel, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. God says in verse 22 of that chapter 3, Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Number one, repent of your sin. Come back to Jesus. Separate yourself from worldly people and from worldly ways. Do not give yourself over to sin. Pray unceasingly for deliverance from any propensity or addiction to sin. Ask others to pray for you. Secondly, saturate yourself with the Word of God. There is power in God's Word to overcome sin. There's a popular saying among Christians that says, Either sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. It's not a Bible verse, but it is very biblical. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 3, to his disciples, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. 
God's word has a supernatural cleansing effect. It cleanses us from our sin. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. God's word has a supernatural cleansing effect. Feed your spirit, man, rather than your flesh. If you have a problem with sin, saturate yourself in the word of God. Take time every day, a lot of time, to meditate on God's word. The Bible truly is a supernatural book that has a supernatural cleansing effect to help us overcome sin. And then number three, restore your prayer life. Take time every day to spend with the Lord Jesus in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, Paul says, there's only three words there, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, pray without ceasing. It is one of the shortest verses in the Bible, but it's also one of the most important It doesn't mean that we are to be in constant prayer uh, every minute of every day. But it means that we are to pray without giving up. We're not to give up on prayer. We're to keep on praying even when we think God is not hearing. In fact, if you think God is not hearing us, then you should pray more often and more fervently. Though we can't be in constant prayer every minute of every day, we should definitely be in constant fellowship and communion with the Lord every minute of every day. So as part of that fellowship, we'll be quick to call on God multiple times throughout the day as situations come up daily in which we need the Lord's intervention and help. Romans 12, verse 12, Paul says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. He says, Continuing instant in prayer. That phrase, continuing instant there, is translated from a single Greek word that means to be constantly vigilant. Strong says it means to be earnest towards to persevere, to be constantly diligent, or to attend assiduously, Strong says, which means to give yourself tirelessly to, unremittingly, or persistently to. So to be instant in prayer is to give yourself unremittingly and tirelessly to prayer. Pray without ceasing. To conclude this message, contrary to the doctrine some hold to, Paul does say in our text, today, that there are some Christians who are carnal. There are carnal Christians. But no Christian should remain in that condition. And so then, if you today are a carnal Christian, and you know it, if you're saved but you don't care enough about the things of God because you're too distracted by the cares of this life, the things of the world, then you need to repent and determine to grow up. Repent of your sin, saturate yourself in the Word of God, restore your prayer life. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, help us to remember this lesson, this message from your word. Lord, help us to grow in Christ. Those of us today that are carnal, walking in the flesh, failing to grow as we should, help us, Lord, to see ourselves for what we are, for the way you see us. Help us not to be complacent, apathetic, lazy in our spirituality, Lord. Help us all to understand that we should all be growing to the point where we can not only feed ourselves, Lord, but to teach others as well. Help us, Lord, to to grow in Christ, to remember that uh, we will grow as we obey your word. And as we obey your word, it will give us more revelation. Help us, Lord, to grow in this way. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Hymn number 496, Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus, 496.